Chris Simons, welcome. Thanks for having me, Brett. Great to have you here. Stoked to have you here. No, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, only recently met you, but I think we've got a lot in common. We're like-minded people. I think we do. Free thinkers, free speakers. That's it. You know, we say what we think and we do what we say at the yeah. end of the day, right? Absolutely. Where did the game of life begin for you? And I've had an interesting uh, life as far. I'm 40 now um, this year. But um, You're young? Yeah, grew up in suburbia with mum and dad. They had a baker's delight, actually. Um, so they were in the bread shop. Yeah. Had an awesome childhood, Brett. Um, you know, I had good friends, great family. Um, life was pretty easy. Uh, struggled through school, though. It um, wasn't until later on in life that they'd kind of worked out that I was struggling to read and write, that I had dyslexia. Um, wasn't ideal, but, you know, you live with it. Left home to school when I was quite young. 14 really uh i was looking for something that i could do academically i wasn't going to be there mm. struggling through school i was a bit of a rat bag no doubt you were as well, well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you look back and you go okay most kids with behavioral problems going through school uh i suppose end up in that position because they're struggling academically a lot of people do a lot of kids struggle academically um so basically looked for a way out didn't really have a horse racing background, but that's where I found myself. Always had a love for animals growing up mm. in the backyard. I had a pet cockatoo, other birds, uh, guinea pigs, rabbits, dog, cat, you name it, turtles. I had it uh, in suburbia, in Mentone. What, Mentone so, you grew up? Yeah, grew really? up in Mentone. Uh, originally Parkdale, went to primary school in Parkdale. Secondary school in Bentley. I went to a play, an all-boys school called uh, St. James. I know it. Yeah, only goes to year 10, so they mustn't think much of the kids going there. They're not <laughs> going to get to the end, but uh, I definitely didn't. I left school and home in year eight. I didn't actually complete year eight. Uh, I had to get permission back then to leave school at such a young age. And prior to that, I was going to the stables, learning a lot about horses, picking up horse shit. Um, I had one relative that was involved in racing, an uncle, and he owned some horses. So he was kind of my in. Mm. Most people in racing, especially jockeys and trainers, are from a racing background. It's quite a niche uh, industry, I suppose. Most jockeys, their granddad or their mum, dad was a jockey at some point. Mm. So I wasn't really bred into it. So I was kind of behind the eight ball already. Um, so I had to work hard to make it in the industry. My only connection my dad was a punter nothing big every weekend he'd be at the tab on uh, standard lower, lower dandenong road back then it was like a it was a, just a smoke fest in there you could smoke in there and he used to take us kids in there and we had to sit there all day while he was having bets i didn't have an interest back then i loved the animal the horse mm. and all sorts of animals but and if i dig deep my great grandfather was uh highly he was involved with squizzy taylor so um, for those of you that don't know who Squizzy Taylor is, he was, you know, a gangster back in the day and, and was involved in horse racing. And uh, my grand, great-grandfather was his right-hand man. So he was one of the biggest professional punters of his era. He also owned a horse back then, and I, I'm not even going to have a guess at what date it was, but he won a big race in New South Wales with a horse named Gay Lover, okay? I'm sure you couldn't call a horse that now. Um and I'm sure it had a different meaning back then. But uh, this horse won a big race called the Epsom Group 1. Mm. And I've actually got the article at home and uh, it kind of goes into into some detail that the race was taken off them by the stewards, the stewards of the police of the racing industry. And, right. Uh, there was talk about some corruption around whether the horse should have been delegated to second rather than the winner uh, back then. So that's my only kind of background in racing um and then you know the rest was up to me i had to to teach myself um basically brought myself a pony taught myself how to ride and from there uh progressively got on bigger horses or ponies to eventually riding race horses in track work and uh then trials and then eventually i was given my brief you know or to permission to ride in races incredible i showed no ability as a jockey some people in most sports or 
genres are, are natural, you know. Some people are natural when they're in water, swimming, surfing, skating, whatever it might be. I was definitely not a natural on horseback. So I had to work extra hard to... Had to earn it. Absolutely, I had to earn it. And uh, showing no ability, even when I was given my opportunity to ride in races, my boss at the time, I'd found myself at headquarters, Flemington, with a trainer called David Hall. David Hall now, today, trains in Hong Kong. Um, And back then, he said, I'm talking 1998, 99 this is when i was given that opportunity to ride in races but as i mentioned showing no ability he said i think it'd be a good idea if you went to south australia uh his father david hall's father joe hall Mm. was training in south australia and uh this is the elite victoria is where it happens we all know the spring carnival flemington uh the melbourne cup etc so a lot of pressure all year round in victoria not so much in south australia so uh, it was a great stepping stone to go over there uh, and basically he said, make your mistakes in South Australia when the audience is much smaller. Make your mistakes there and then come back. He said, just go over for three months, make your mistakes and come home. I was that bad a rider. <laughs> I was stuck there for two years, right? <laughs> so uh, during that time, you know, I learnt my my trade and and i improved and i had a hard boss david hall's father joe hall Mm. man he he was hard yakka he he worked me hard and uh he modeled me into what i am today and but i must say back then i resented it you know i he was very strict he i lived at the stables Mm. i had to get permission to go up to the local shops to get a, a bottle of water or packet of darts you know like uh he and god forbid he knew if i smoked you know that that was a big no-no i he had to know where i was all the time he was a role model he was a he was a parent to me but when you've got someone at you all the time you you learn to hate it you know Mm. you don't like it it's not until later on in life i look back at that opportunity that he gave me not knowing back then it was an opportunity but he gave me what i have today a great work ethic uh the ability to talk in public the ability to talk properly um Mm. i remember sitting at a table and i was treated like a family member there brett you know they he and his wife polly and and joe treated me like their son and i used to go in and have dinner with them every night if they had guests over i would still sit at the dinner table and I remember one day replying to one of um, his friends with a blunt, yeah. And he pulled me up in front of everyone. He said, it's not yeah, it's yes. And it's those little things. And at the time you're thinking, oh, shut up. Mm. But you look back and you go, well, he's helped me in so many areas. And it's not until later on that you realize where he's helped you. you How know? old were you at the time when he was like your mentor? And so about 16 and a mm, half, I would have been. Real and formative years of a, an adolescent transitioning into a young adult. Yeah. And I had a lot of things going on in the background. As I said, I had a fantastic childhood. I've got the best relationship even today with my mum and my dad. But during that time I was in South Australia, they split up and that was hard, mm, you know, for me. Um, knowing that, This family that I'd left in Victoria had now separated different houses and, you know, and it did become complicated. Thankfully, my parents have always seen eye to eye. It wasn't an ugly divorce. I'm one of three kids, the youngest of three, and uh, we'd all kind of moved on in our lives. So I wasn't a, a young child when it happened, and I see friends parents split up at a young i think the older you are when that kind of happens the easier it is to absorb yeah i think so. um definitely and it's so widespread now for whatever reason you know so many of my own daughter's friends um their parents are separated and i don't know whether i notice it more now that i'm older or what but anyway it is what it is people grow apart and that's mm. exactly what happened with my parents which i've accepted and so have they but I'm a kid going through puberty, away from home. Um, and I had, you know, bef- long before that Flemington stint with, with David Hall, I was apprenticed to another 
um, family and things weren't great there. You know, I'd had some, you know, shit things happen to me in that setting as a kid and accepted it then and wasn't until later on that I knew it was unacceptable and, and I moved on from that and got out of that toxic kind of environment. Um, and, you know, I we've all had things happen to us in our lives and they help model who you are today, whether mm. that be good or bad. Um, and, you know, I look back on that bad experience and I learned a lot out of it and I've been able to change things, which I'll discuss into the future for other people that might find themselves in a position that I once did. Um, but I go back to a great family. You know, I, I've, I'm really fortunate and I know so many people aren't, but I had a, awesome childhood and, mm. and uh and a great family but i talk about this journey and and it, and that's kind of where it started and i became a jockey and um you know for 21 years i rode horses in races and and it was an incredible experience and um and i started with zero ability but i worked hard and harder and harder and harder and it was credibility um, and my work ethic that took me to the level that it took me. I was far from being the best jockey in that 21 years, but I was the best that I could be. And that's all anyone can do. Did I have the dedication that others had? In certain aspects I did, but in certain areas I didn't. I love the horse. That's what I, That was my passion. And, um, and I like most people, I liked money as well, you know, and as a jockey, you can make a very good living, you know, you really can, but you're young and do we spend our money properly? Probably not. <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> um, and we look back at decisions that we made and I should be in a greater position I am now, but it is what it is. I've enjoyed every moment of it, but I worked hard as a jockey, mm. uh, not only uh, to get rides, but, um, you know, physically with weight loss, um, starvation, what a lot of jockeys endure in that 21 years. And along that journey, um, yeah, I wasn't well educated academically, but I was streetwise in a way. And I finally arrived back in Victoria after that two year stint in uh, South Australia. And uh, I suppose for any jockey, you're an apprentice, right? So you generally do a four-year apprenticeship. I had a lot of injuries as an apprentice, so they actually extended my time as an apprentice because to dumb it down for a non-racing person, an apprentice is still competing a bit against the best in the business. So in this situation, back in Victoria, I'm an, an apprentice. The claiming three. Claiming four. three, yeah. So I'll explain that for the listeners. So I'm competing against the likes of Damien Oliver and um, Craig Williams and so many other. Stephen King. Absolutely. Darren Gouches, you know. So so many great jockeys that I'm competing against. But I'm a, a gangly kid that's got no idea, you know. So How much what, did you weigh? How much did you weigh back then? Oh, when I first kicked off, I would have weighed 50 to 51 kilos. So I was quite light. And it, you mentioned claiming three. So just to dumb that down. So as an apprentice, um, there needs to be an incentive for owners and trainers to put you on a horse. We don't own our own horses. In fact, it's against the rules of racing to own your own horse, right? So you're relying on other people buying horses and, and, and riding theirs. So um, claiming three uh, to dumb it down, uh, you subtract three kilos off the horse's weight. So if a horse has got... So it's 50, like handicap, the amount of weight it carries... Correct. So, ...to make the fields even, right? Exactly. So most races are handicapped. Yeah. Uh, some are weight for age. But a horse has got 56 kilos, and if Damien Oliver rides it, it's got 56 kilos. But if Chris Simon's apprentice claiming three rides it, I take three kilos off it. So all of a sudden it's carrying three kilos less, which is 53 kilos. So how much right? time would that save the horse in a race, let's say, over 1,600 metres? Yeah, it doesn't sound like much, does yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. But it's significant in right. a race. Um, I think more significant in the bob of the head sort of scenario. And yeah. when I say like a photo finish, weight definitely plays a factor. Distance plays a factor. A heavy track being a, a, a rain-affected track definitely plays 
affect us. So, so it's all those little one percenters. Yeah, that one percent. The difference that makes a difference. So that that's the incentive that the racing industry globally, I believe, mm. have for apprentices. You've got to start somewhere, but you still need opportunity. So this gives you that opportunity to make mistakes because you are going to make mistakes as a an apprentice, as a senior jockey, right? Um, in any form of life we, life, all make, all the, we learn all from the way it. through and that's the risk that an owner or trainer takes yeah when they get a three kilo claiming apprentice now once you've ridden x amount of winners that three kilos diminishes to two kilos for a period of time or till you outride the quota of winners to bring you down to a kilo and a half till eventually you have no claim okay so that happens or you finish your apprenticeship. So keep in mind when you finish your apprenticeship, it's probably the toughest time for any apprentice um, jockey to go through because to the naked eye or the, the trainer, owner, or even the public's eye, you're still a kid. You're still an, you, you don't have that A next to your name, but no one really looks at you as a senior jockey. So it's probably the most challenging time for any jockey coming out of their apprenticeship. And it, that's if you go through the stats, whether it was Damien Oliver, Darren Gauchy, or Chris Simons, uh, basically that's the toughest time you'll have um, because in the trainer, owner's eyes, you're still a kid. So I was at that point. I wasn't getting the results. I wasn't getting the amount of rides that I wanted. I wasn't riding at Flemington. I was going to, you know, witchy proof or, um, you know, these beat it up tracks in the bush. So on those plum days during the spring carnival, keep in mind during the spring carnival, the claims irrelevant. Okay. So the claim doesn't come in because, um, they're non claiming races like the Melbourne cup, for example, an apprentice can't take weight right. off it. Right. But this is where you have to grab an opportunity. So Damien Oliver, for example, may have won two or three races in a row on a particular horse. So the weight of this horse keeps increasing because they're handicapped. So all of a sudden, the trainer goes, oh, I want to take some weight off its back. Chris Simons is claiming three. We'll give him that opportunity. You win on that horse, right? You might have the opportunity to continue riding that horse and create a relationship with that owner that trainer that might and the animal and the animal for sure so uh you were relying on luck a lot of the time and also your ability so back to me when i came out of my apprenticeship mm. life was stagnant i wasn't getting the opportunities i wasn't kind of reaping any rewards but what i did notice were jockeys were losing weight to ride in races to the point which i've done turning your car into a mobile microwave. And I'll explain how that wow. works, right? So let's before, just... Before you go on, and, and sorry to interrupt, how much did you pay for your first, first pony? I'm, I'm really intrigued. That first pony... I reckon the, about $600. Really? And it was a rat bag. And was then it? I found out later in life, he wasn't even broken in. So I learned, oh, really? I learned how to ride pretty damn quick because I uh, couldn't keep that dot in the middle, the dot being your asshole. Right? So, <laughs> it sounded like you both weren't broken in as well. Yeah, but little Bobby, he was a soldier, you know. Right. He taught me a lot. He was a tiny little Shetland pony, possibly the worst sort of animal you could learn how to ride on. But um, I soon learned how to stick with him. But, um, yeah, about 600 bucks from memory. Okay. Um, so the mobile sauna microwave mm. so what i used to do and so many other jockeys did as well we used to sit in saunas hot spas but i'll give you a situation time isn't your friend as a jockey you start early mornings we exercise the horses at four in the morning yeah and there's a, people always ask that question why do you work horses that early well races during the day you know you've got to get these horses exercise they're an exercise they're an athlete okay so basically like any other athlete runner swimmer etc we exercise them in the morning it's cool especially during summer and it's quiet the thoroughbreds are highly strung animal mm. um so 4 a.m at most race courses around australia or the world there will be movement there'll be lights on and there'll be 
a whole lot of work getting done while you're sleeping in bed. So we exercise the horses early. Then all of a sudden it's nine o'clock. I've got to leave to go to the races. Uh, but I haven't had that time to sit in a sauna. I haven't had time to sit in a, a hot spa. So I run 200 metres dressed up like an Eskimo. Layers and layers of tracksuit pants. Garbage like bags? Garbage bags, jackets, beanie, gloves, rubber gloves that you'd wash your dishes with, right? You don't want your body to breathe. You run wow. 150 metres. Meanwhile, your car's turned on, the heater blaring. You get your heart rate up, jump in the car, and away I am, off to the races, two and a half hour drive to Bendigo, sweating bullets. The right? whole way? The whole way. And you'd have the, the heater well, on the you'd car? Have, you'll, you'll, <laughs> you might drive around along the colder freeway, and, colder freeway one day and see a little person on the side of the road in their undies standing on a set of scales in the truck stop. You know, that was what we wow. did. That's what we do. Wow. You know? Yeah, so dedication you might not have eaten the night before you definitely wouldn't have eaten that morning sweating it out so that you can make weight it's amazing your brain um you you can convince your brain to do anything it's a the most powerful tool right mm -hmm. uh you just got to be dedicated you can starve yourself for days it's all in your head, yeah. How, how would you do that, though? For somebody listening there, they'd be sitting there and they'd be listening to some of the things you're saying. And for you, for yourself, it's second nature. And I, I sit there and think about, you know, the power of disassociation where I go outside of myself and then I look at the outcome that I want to achieve. And then I go, okay, what do I need to think in this moment to go and do the things that I need to do to have the outcome that I want to have? Is it Was it similar for you back Absolutely. then? Absolutely. You've got to motivate yourself, okay? And that can be easy at times but probably more challenging in other times what about when you're friggin dehydrated well you're dehydrated ah. uh you the body is an amazing thing and it's resilient yeah and this people wouldn't believe me saying this if i needed to lose two kilos driving to bendigo mm. i would lose two kilos driving to bendigo it wouldn't be a 100 grams more or 100 grams less. Your body somehow knows what you need to do, right? And, you know, on the odd occasion, I'd get to Bendigo, sail, wherever, and it didn't happen for me. I, I might have to go for a run around the track or I may have lost too much. But more often than not, your body just knows the limit. I don't know how to explain that, mm. but you've just convinced your body and brain, I just need to lose 500 grams or a kilo or whatever, and that is what you will do. The you've, power of manifestation yeah. got a lot to be said, right? But on the absolutely, but on the the flip side, you would have to be doing some sort of damage to your body along the way. Cramps, fatigue, but adrenaline can overcome a lot of that, mm, sure. right? So you can rock up to the races and you're spent, like. But as soon as you get on that horse, it all goes out the window. As soon as those barriers open, adrenaline kicks in, right? I could count on one hand how many times it didn't in my 21-year career. Wow, really? Yeah, um, because I had had several occasions mid-race and my legs have cramped up um but you learn along the way what what brings that on and it sounds silly but i could lose two and a half or two kilos one and a half whatever and after that light ride i could i was able to have 600 mils of water and i'd just guzzle it right <laughs> but what would happen is i'd ride in the next race obviously I didn't have to lose weight for that next race. It's not every race. It's just you might turn up at the races with six rides and only mm. one of those is really low. And that's the only one you have to lose that weight for, yeah? Um, gotcha. So you ride later on in the day, but I've guzzled that 600 mil bottle. And what happens, my body, everyone's body is different, but my body used to grab it. And when it grabbed it, I, my, I would have spasms in my hands holding the reins or my whole body would start seizing up and so what i found personally would work would be just basically sipping 
don't gu- and it was so hard to refrain from guzzling that 600 mm. mil because you are as dry as wow. a chip yeah and uh basically you if you put that 600 mils in your whole body would grab it and I, that's what how i describe right. it yeah and your 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 legs start so going grab it you cramp go, up right. everywhere so what i used to do is just have um sip 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 you know because i and then at the end of the day you would binge eat binge drink you know and most jockeys would do that um it's not a natural thing to do to lose i'm quite boutique I'm, not, I'm quite skinny though i didn't have much weight to lose the only thing i had to lose was fluid i'm quite tall for a jockey so what i noticed this brings me to what i i thought might help myself and others in this situation and and it was uh i i went to spotlight and I bought myself an electric blanket and I took it home. And I used to have this mechanical horse that I used to practice riding on at home. Um, and I, I got the electric blanket I wrapped around myself, plugged it into the wall. Probably not. I wouldn't suggest doing this. <laughs> um, and I turned it on and I started riding this mechanical horse with the electric blanket on. And boom, I started sweating. So now my next feet was I needed to make this portable, right? Imagine having a portable heated jacket, right? So as I also mentioned, my parents had split up. I'm back home. I'm living in Victoria. I'm finishing my apprenticeship and my mum's got a new partner and he seemed like a nice guy at the time. And I approached him and said, hey, I've got this idea. Uh, What are your thoughts? Heated jacket. So together, we investigated and we worked out that we could create infrared heat, the coils in a jacket. So we created the first, say, ever heated jackets, right? And then what we worked out, operated by battery, they could go underwater, heated wetsuits. Mm. This was going to be huge. We went to America, Los Angeles. We wanted some big wigs to endorse this product. We went to a place called San Anita. We were thinking of people that it could benefit. So an American jockey that had a a big name over there, um, Gary Stevens was the one that we wanted to approach. He was big in the States. While I was over in uh, Los Angeles, I got approached by a trainer and she asked me if I would be interested in going to the States to ride. And uh, as I said, I was in... I was going nowhere where I was. How I just, old were you then? Uh, so I'm now probably 21, okay. roughly. I've skipped a massive part. I was with a, a girlfriend uh, her name, who I married today. Her name's Sam, which I'll talk a lot more about her. She's in, awesome. Yeah. Lovely. In the future of this podcast. But um, we're in the States. I get invited to go over. I thought, why not? You know, I'm going nowhere in Victoria. This is a good opportunity. So got home. Sam and I got a visa each. We went over to Seattle uh, and I started riding there. And meanwhile, Rob, the guy with the jackets, was doing what he did with the jackets, trying to get that off the ground in Victoria. So we were in the States, had quite a successful stint. I wasn't in Santa Anita, which is equivalent to Flemington in Australia. I was in Seattle at a place called Emerald Downs. Grunge City. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Punk rock, grunge city. Throwback to the 90s. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that scene. Yeah. So I was where I wanted to be. Beautiful city, Seattle. Um, Loved living there. It was really enjoyable. Met some fantastic people. Had quite a successful stint there. Um, So this is equivalent to, say, South Australian racing, borderline Tasmanian racing. Okay. And I'm not being disrespectful to sure. Emerald Downs, nor am I being disrespectful to South Australia or Tassie. Um, but that was the equivalent of where I was, right? Um, but people in Australia didn't know that. So I kind of manipulated the situation that I was in. I was having success. So I thought it's important that people in Victoria knew that I was having success. So I used to let the media know. I used to. This is before social media, you know. Like I'm. So how would you let them know? Just via telephone and call them up. Yeah, SMS. Yeah, yeah. Old SMS back in the day. Um, So 
coming home, people are like, wow, he had the best time. He was successful. And the reason I left Seattle, Emerald Downs, was because their racing was so different to ours. And without boring your listeners with how it was different was, first of all, they race on dirt. They have claiming races, which meant that every horse in particular races were for sale, um, which created corruption. Yeah, it's a whole um, different scene, right? The way can, it's all run. Yeah, 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 they can race their horses with a drug called Lasix, which um, dehydrates a horse to stop them bleeding out their nose. Um, wow. They can race them on butte, certain amounts of butte, which is basically a, um, I wouldn't say as far as morphine, but it's it's a anti-inflammatory, I suppose, for, an, for a horse. So not allowed to race with any of those drugs in Australia, okay? Mm. So America's a little bit different. Um, and without being sounding disrespectful, they were a little bit behind the times when it came to what we were doing here in Australia, working our horses, exercising our horses, racing our horses and whatever. Everything was so different. Uh, and again, I'm not putting them down. It was just, it was a real eye opener for me. But I got to a point where I thought, this is dangerous, you know. I, I, I was looking for a way out. We had a five-year visa, visa there, but we were there for six, seven months. I rode 35 winners there, and I said, you know what, I'm done. Let's go home. So we came home. Um, while I was over there, the jacket, heater jacket, jet hot jocks had gone pear-shaped because mum and Rob had split up. Um, he was trying to filter me out of this equation somehow, some way, and in doing so, somehow Rip Curl ended up with this heated wetsuit product that we'd created. And to be honest, both of us ended up with nothing from it. Um, and, you know, that was hard to, to comprehend. I was banking on this. I was a jockey. Was I enjoying it? I pretended I was, but I was kind of over it. Um, but it's all I knew. I was kind of banking on this jacket thing to take off to get me the fuck out of racing, you know, because I'd had enough. But and especially where you came from and all the hard work you had to do from the origins of when you got into it. Absolutely. Was a real passion back then. Yeah, and it yeah. sounds like it probably wasn't. It was a way for you to... What was it back then, like when you first began? It was you... a means to an end, right? There you go, yeah. And uh, But I didn't showcase that. And there were big parts of racing that I really did enjoy, but sometimes the bad outweighed the good. Sure. It's a high-pressure game mm. that we're in. The pressures from everywhere, the public, the owner, the trainer, peers, you know, it was. it's a cutthroat industry. It's a... You have to be resilient. You're yeah. under the spotlight, right? To Absolutely. Everyone. Yeah. So back in Oz, jacket's gone pear-shaped, but I've manipulated sort of people thinking that I've been this hot shot in America. I worked hard. I still had my, my work ethic and I hit the ground running. I created these relationships with different trainers in Victoria, one of which was Matty Allerton and Simon, Simon. Zara, um, Greg Urell. And I formed these great relationships with them and the stars started to line up. Horses that were big odds started winning for me, which created more opportunities with these trainers and, and it just snowballed from there. I'm riding winners at Flemington, Mooney Valley, Oh, yeah, Caulfield. I remember, yeah. If I ever saw, if I ever saw Aladdin and Zara with, with Simon's yeah. riding at Flemington, um, I'd, I'd back it. And the value was usually around 8 to 10 to 1 on a lot of those yeah. rides too. You know, Absolutely. It wasn't, you weren't riding favourites all the time. However, the combination, yeah. you used to get the best out of them together, I remember. Exactly. Always, yeah. And uh, it, what that does is it gives you confidence, okay? You can do anything with confidence, whether you're a human whether you're a horse, right? Wow. Confidence is is a key factor. Um, so I took took advantage of this. I, I worked hard. I got winners. I had a great strike rate. I was up there riding against the best of the best and I was riding listed and group winners. Um, but I'll always be known for that jockey 
that never won a group one. I had plenty of seconds. Didn't in win any group ones. ones. Ne- I've never won a group one. How I many, probably many... should have. Um, I've never won any group ones either. <laughs> <laughs> I won a group three as an owner, yeah. uh, but never a group one. So, so you won group twos, group threes? Group, plenty of group twos, yep. plenty of group threes, wow. plenty of listed races, um, and plenty of winners. 1,200 winners in my career as wow. a jockey, and um, that's a great achievement, and Absolutely. I'm happy with that. Absolutely. And, you know, disappointing. I didn't get that group one, and but boy, I tried. You know, I worked hard, and um, but sometimes I turned left when I should have turned right. Those sort of things. I was uh, unlucky in a few. I, I ran second in a, a blue diamond um, for for David Hayes, and had plenty of um, placings in, with for Matty Allerton and and uh, even Greg Ural in Group One events, beaten a bee's dick on say, certain occasions. What was the know? closest you got, or you thought that you'd actually? Yeah, I think it was a horse called Red Colossus in the Adelaide Derby, uh, SA Derby, and I got beaten a whisker. You know that was that was hard to to live with. But anyway, it is what it is. What and did you learn from that? What did you learn? What did you learn? from experiencing what you would have experienced in that time and some of the feelings that you might have had because you would have been pretty premature in your in your racing career sure uh i suppose i learned more resilience i learned how to block negative shit out of my life because if i didn't it would have an impact on so many other things right. yeah um so i've always been a glass half full type of guy you know and that and that's you know the jackets got smashed you know, I got smashed in that situation, but I moved on pretty damn quick. I didn't want to hone in on a negative, and I'll talk about that a little bit mm. later on, you know. Um, I may as well talk about it now. I'm leading into a spring yeah. carnival. I don't know what year it is, maybe 2000 and let's say 13, right? And that's a yeah, just a guess. Somewhere in between. Yep. Yeah. We're leading into a spring carnival, and I've got some pretty good horses around me. I'm... I won a stakes race the week prior to this or a few days prior to this, what I'm about to tell you. And I'm at sale races, East Gippsland, two and a half hour drive away. And I've had an unsuccessful day and I'm walking out of the races with my bag on wheels. You take your gear to the races, saddles, towels, whatever you need. I'm wheeling it out, and I see this car. Well, first of all, I open my car boot. So my boot of my car is open, right? And I see this car reversing towards me, and I put my bag into the boot of my car, and I see this car, and it's getting faster, and it's getting closer. And I thought it was one of the other jockeys just playing a joke because that's what we actually do. We play jokes on one another. It's a great atmosphere in a Victorian jockey's room. I can't say that. For every state, but the Victorian jockey's room, as much as it's competitive, we have a lot of fun in there, right? So, for example, at Mooney Valley, there's five showers, right, in a row, but there's only one drain down one end. So I used to go down the opposite end and tip yellow bottles of Gatorade into the <laughs> shower and it would run down every shower and they'd all jump out thinking I was pissing in the shower, yeah. right? In the end, I used to piss in the shower because I thought it was Gatorade, but... um Anyway, so <laughs> I just thought it was one of the other jockeys playing a joke. So this car's getting closer, it's getting faster. Last minute, I thought, I'm in trouble here. I jumped into the boot of my car, right? But I'm, unfortunately, my left foot didn't make it. And this car went smashing into my car and my foot got pinned in between the two cars. That wasn't no the painful part. The painful part when I was banging on the back of this window for the car to move forward to release my foot, right? So eventually it moves forward, releases my foot, and I'm lying on the ground, as you can imagine, in excruciating pain. My foot looked like a a pancake, right? So the car door opens and this little person gets out and it was one apprentice jockey, Tommy Sadler. And I swear (laughs) to God, you couldn't make this shit up, right? I looked at him and I said, what the fuck were you doing? And he looked at me, no word of a lie, and his little squeaky voice, he goes, oh, sorry, Jock, I couldn't reach the pedal. I kid you not. He was only <laughs> wow. about 16, 17. He was on his owls, and someone taller had driven the car to the races, and he was driving the car back, right? 
He couldn't reach the pedals, plowed into my car. He's put me on the sidelines for probably four to six months, right? So I look around and I see all these other jockeys and I think, far out, I'm lucky. They're all on their phones, you know. I think they're ringing for an ambulance. How wrong I was. They were actually all ringing up for my rides because they knew I was <laughs> out for a while, right? Wow. So um, <laughs> that, was a, that was a bit of a downer, you know. So... I didn't want to go to the hospital in sale with all due respects to the hospital in sale. I wanted, I wanted to go to Epworth in Best Melbourne. of the best. Yeah. You wanted, this is your career, your yeah. livelihood, what you put so much of your life into. Yeah. I didn't know what damage I'd done. So I got my mate, Damien Lane, another jockey. Yeah. He drove my car straight to a servo. We got a bag of ice and he drove me two and a half hours to Epworth with a no drugs, I'm in a bit of pain and my foot looks like a pancake, oh. right? So I get to Epworth, damage is they need to put steel plates and stuff in my foot and it is what it is, right? So that's okay. I get home, had surgery. I did not want to dwell on a negative, right? I could have quite easily, spring carnival, all of a sudden I'm at home watching every horse that I've done all the work on, about to win races or win races over the spring carnival. So I'm like, find a positive. So social media is just starting around now, you know, like for me, I get a Twitter account. Oh, yeah. Next minute, I people are hearing, I had a bit of a profile, I suppose, in racing. So people are like, this is a crazy story. A peer's been run over by, you know, uh, appear and uh, yeah. yeah and and basically I took the piss out of it using that same story I told you I just took the piss out of it and that people like to laugh you know so what that did for me was it created more of a profile it was able I was able to put my personality out there happy go lucky trying to be funny sort of guy right so with that triple emma running with the story it's on i think it even made it onto certain news programs etc um and i would also i was also asked to be on the uh victorian jockeys association a board member on that um so i was already currently a board member for the victorian jockeys association so while i was out at injured etc i got a phone call from the chairman or sorry the ceo a, a gentleman named des o'keith rings me up and says um channel seven who had the the rights to the spring carnival wanted to catch up with des o'keith and he wanted to bring me along um, to talk about some new initiatives that they wanted to implement on horse racing for their coverage. So uh, off I went on my crutches, hopped in there, <laughs> and uh, I sat down with the team of Channel 7 and Des O'Keefe, and they were talking about wanting to get some live or some audio in a race, the thundering hooves, the talking in a race. Jockeys do talk, scream at each other in a race. It's just a common practice um, to communicate out there. You would be surprised what comes out of oh, some people's mouths yeah. um quite vile anyway so little did they know and little does anyone else know that i had been tinkering with some small cameras right i'd picked them up from j car they were like a little pencil camera oh, yeah. and i was playing with them to see if i could start filming certain things on horseback right they took audio they got vision so next minute I said, you know, maybe we can go a step further. I've found these cameras. So with the help of Channel 7, Des O'Keefe, the Jockeys Association, was the birth of Jockey Cam, right? We've come a long way since our first camera um, six to eight years ago. Uh, it started off with a, a little pencil camera to eventually we progressed to the Sony action cameras that was had more stability um, because those first cameras, you look back at them and it, you got sick watching a jockey in a race, right? <laughs> yeah. So this spring, this spring carnival that I'm out of action with a broken foot, I'm working for Channel 7, trying to make this work with the, the, the pencil cams and it, and it did. It was a success. Amazing. And what that did for me, Brett, was it created a relationship with Channel 7. So 
Um, and this relationship got bigger and it got stronger, which got me to the point where I was learning how to do interviewing. I was uh, public speaking, um, doing other roles for Channel 7, learning a lot more, going to watch the Channel 7 coverage behind the scenes for the AFL to see what we could implement there. Or And, and next minute, not that it was me that created this, but we've got cameras on cricketers, umpires, you know, it, and the, the, all these sports were evolving, wow. but racing wasn't in certain aspects. But all of a sudden we had this helmet camera and it really helped racing take another step with these other sports, which was pretty awesome. It's funny how things happen, yeah? You're pretty entrepreneurial. I just like to think outside the square. You do, very much so. Um, very creative. While I was also out, I started networking. This kind of started when I got back from the States. I started networking. I worked out that you needed to build relationships, not only with trainers, but just as important with people that own horses, mm. right? And I had these relationships with Matty Allen and Simon Zara, and this was the the connection where I ended up with a really good friend named Jeff Alice. And Jeff Alice was heavily involved with his wife with Boost Juice, okay? So... Um, Janine and Jeff Alice mm. were the creators of Boost Juice, as you probably are aware. And he started buying some horses and he trusted me and uh, I trusted him. And uh, we created this great relationship together where I would ride his horses both in track work and in races. And he was new to the game. And racing is a game that can gobble people up. Racing is a game where... They're really streetwise. They're smart and somewhat cunning. They can see money coming and they will grab it with both hands. They, mm. Do you know what I mean? Whether that be a jockey, whether that be a trainer, right? <laughs> like your mates on the phone after you pancaked your foot. They're exactly. all ringing up for your ride. It's a ruthless it, like, industry, right? Capitalism and in full swing, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah. And I was one that saw a guy come into racing by the name of Nathan Tinkler. Now, Google Nathan Tinkler because he was... Um, he became a multi-millionaire overnight in the mines. Mining, right? I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, and he went and cre- created this emperor or a, he, he, he built this racing stable. He bought horses overseas in Australia, trucks, stables. He was throwing money everywhere and he approached me to be his stable rider, whether this was pre or Post the foot incident, I can't remember, right? I went to a meeting and I was going to be his rider. Um, And some of the things didn't weigh up for me and I felt like I was going to lose a lot of control of my riding life um, being kind of snowed in as a uh, contracted rider just for him. And I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket, so to speak. So Mm -hmm. I neglected to go to that nathan tingler camp and but i watched it implode or explode in time because Mm. and you know it's been well documented he invested millions and millions of dollars and today doesn't have anything you know in the racing industry he was burnt along the way and no doubt he burnt people as well sure in what is sometimes a toxic industry Mm. right so i saw that destruction of him happen and i didn't not that jeff and jeff alice was coming in with that sort of money he was very conservative but i didn't want to see this now friend of mine get his pants pulled down right so i made it my duty to make sure that i would always provide him honest information, whether that be about his horses, whether that be about where he's sending his horses, etc. So he trusted me and I trusted him and we, to this day, have a really good relationship together. And he went hard into the industry and doesn't have as many horses or, or as involved as he once was because I suppose, and I can't speak for him, but he may have seen some toxicity in this industry but away from racing jeff was also um very well connected um and was very 
involved with Oz Stereo, and I can't remember his full position, but uh, he played a big role at Oz Stereo, which is Fox FM and Triple M. And um, in fact, Jeff and I created a podcast, and it was called In the Saddle. Uh, and we did maybe seven or eight episodes of that. And uh, it had, you know, pretty good feedback. And it was just more of the, it was to the the newbies of racing, what to expect, how to get involved, what to buy, what to look for, uh, where to be careful. It was just a real insight into what he'd experienced in racing and him being an owner, me being a jockey, we were able to express different things. And for racing that's got, you know, in the whole scheme of things, a pretty minute audience when I'm talking population. It's a real niche. Yeah, it isn't is. It? Yeah. Um, what Jeff and I were trying to do was trying to cater for non-racing people that might want to get involved. and The mums and dads who might have watched the Melbourne Cup and exactly. had some excitement about yeah. back in number and eight and not winning and then... Promote the industry, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that went well. It had over 100,000 downloads through podcast one and and we were going to look at doing other seasons and whatever but we're both busy and it was really time consuming to do but um i learned a lot not only from that but i've learned a lot from jeff um because he was heavily involved in boost back then and um i learned a lot about their branding and what they were doing with with uh you know um expanding their 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 brand and and that helped me because i wanted to help racing and that's where the helmet cam was part of that racing and i've said it on a couple of occasions is can be toxic and and it starts at the top and it works its way down and i know this because i've had to go to the top the things that i've wanted to bring into racing and it frustrates me even while i think about it Mm. the things that Jeff and I or me singly have taken to racing to try and help them evolve you know everyone and everything has a use by date whether you're an athlete a singer whatever it is you play there is the best but they have a use by date whether it's a business use by date and I'll give you an example I'll give you a couple 1,300 years ago, there used to be a place called the Colosseum in Rome where they used to slaughter animals, Christians. It was barbaric, right? It doesn't exist today and nor should it. But 1,300 years ago, they decided this is not right. Maybe that's why it stopped. People evolved, right? Sure. When I was a kid, I used to go to the circus. I remember one year I went, they had all sorts of animals there, lions and tigers. And I remember that because I remember one of the lions did a shit right in front of where I was sitting (laughs) and it stunk for the rest of the night. Circuses today do not have exotic animals performing acts, right? So this is where I bring you to racing, you know, and I bang my head against the wall at times because racing's been around forever hundreds of years or at least 150 in australia Mm. um and they're basically doing the exact same thing that they were doing back then they haven't evolved and when i say evolved you need to move with the times you need to cater for those that you think you shouldn't at times um whether that be football cricket look i'm not a cricket fan I never will be. It doesn't really interest me. It's a little bit slow for me. Yeah, it's too slow for you. And, uh, but, and I might be wrong. Cricket was kind of dying out a bit. Boring game. Then they bought the Big Bash 2020. You know, they brought it back to Injected life. Injected some life into it, yeah. Love it. You know, like, I don't love cricket, but I love what they did sure. to bring it back to life. Uh, footy brought in night games, you know, and they're always tinkering with different things to keep it relevant. And the golf now with a new live tour, like yeah. bringing that up and throwing Absolutely. a bunch of money at it. Yeah. So these are things that I kept saying to racing, we need to evolve, you know. The only thing in that racing changed in the time that I was involved in it was they brought in night races. Great initiative, right? 
Um, the helmet cam, you know, with the help of Channel 7 and myself. But that's basically it, right? They're, it's They brought in padded whips and they restricted the use of whips. Sure. And I have a view on that, you know, um, and I've spoken publicly about it and been ridiculed for it. What is um, it? Um, well, do I think that the whip's hurting a horse? None of us really know. They run faster when it hits their ass, don't they? Why? I don't know. Is it the noise that it makes? Maybe. Um, would we still have a winner without a whip? Yeah, there's 24 horses in the Melbourne Cup and I'll bet your balls that there will still be a winner with or without a whip. Um, perception. Okay, this brings us to perception, yeah? Mm. It, it, it's 99% of everything. Everything. 100%. And this is what I keep saying and I advocate for it. Perception, whether that be with what I do today, mm. which I'll talk about shortly with yeah. my sanctuary, or whether it be with racing, you have to stay relevant. Perception is 99% of everything, and everyone and everything has a use by date. I agree. Like it or not. I feel like I'm coming up to my use by date in business, and I've been in it for 27 years. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, maybe this is like my last season, right? Yeah. I get it. I yeah. really do get it. So. You need to move with the times, whether it be through social media or, mm. or other. Um, and unfortunately, the toxicity starts at the top in racing and it filters its way down. And I go back to, you know, I've taken Jeff, Jeff Alice and I created a reality TV show for horse racing. We invested our own money to create a pilot and we took it to Racing Victoria on a silver platter and basically got laughed out, mm. right? How long ago was this? Oh, this is, this would have to be six, seven years yeah. ago, right? So, but then we see the F1. I don't know where, I haven't watched it, but I hear so much about this reality TV show they've done for the F1 that just, it was like a rebirth. Mm. It's done so much for their ratings, bringing their engagement, etc. And this is recent and I just go, wow. We got basically laughed out with a reality TV show about racing that could have possibly been on mainstream. And if the idea isn't theirs, they're not interested. So these are things that I've learned along the way. You need to almost manipulate them into thinking it is their idea. And it's, that's. It's interesting you say this, Chris. I've been in the technology industry since I was 19 years old. Started off packing boxes, sending out orders for sales reps, and my marketing has been laughed at numerous times. I've been told my marketing doesn't work, and yet I've built and sold two businesses, one of them of which was one of the fastest growing companies in the country in 2014. Fifth fastest growing company across all industries, across all sectors in the country. And still to this day, people will say to me that my marketing doesn't work. And what I've learned, and there's similarities, is the corporate machine is the corporate machine. And I think more so in the racing industry, there's controls behind the scenes, whether it be government, um, and they're pulling the strings. And like you said, there's an element, I think, of if it's not their idea, and you know, some people can play the political game to get to the top, and then there's free spirit of thinkers like yourself, yeah. very creative, very entrepreneurial, very innovative, and people hear this stuff and it's really confronting for them. And they don't like to bloody well hear it. And yet, if they adopted the mindset of the entrepreneurial types and being more innovative, it'd help their results and also those around them. Yet some people are like short-sighted, like a yeah, yeah. like a horse wearing its blinkers mm. in a two-year-old maiden, right? So. And it's amazing how many people get pissed off along the way. <laughs> so with perception, right, um, and I'll just go backtrack a bit about the whip. Perception is 99% of everything, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. Now, um, every advertisement of whether it be on a billboard, commercial, um, or other, with racing is the final kind of 100 metres of the race, right? Now, with the rules of racing, when it comes to using the whip, um, basically, that's when they've got unlimited access to the whip 
within reason, right? So naturally, every image that's taken in that last 100 metres of the race, what is, mm. what's 70% of the jockeys doing at that time? They've got their hand up in the air and they're about to hit an animal with a stick. That's the reality of it. Yep. That's what the broader public see today, okay? And um, this is just one of many of things that racing need to evolve with. Do I agree that the whip shouldn't be there? Not necessarily. I still think it's a very important tool for a jockey to have. Don't forget you're on a 650 plus kilo animal, right? Uh, that could take control of you at any time, any moment. Um, so if it's used correctly, you know, it's, it's a tool that they need. And there's, everyone's got a different view on it. The problem is, is it the minorities that don't want it or is it the majorities, right? Well, I think it's the minorities in most things, but the minorities are getting bigger and they're getting a bigger voice and you have to, unfortunately, evolve with them, okay? And, and unless you do, racing's used by date will it will come too soon. It'll come in our lifetime, right? I'm and I'm a, I'm a believer of that, you know? And I'll give you an example. Some years ago, uh, greyhound racing in New South Wales was pretty much stopped. It was only a change of government that got it back up again. Right. So that just proves to you that it's on the nose. Animals and entertainment is on the nose. And I don't want to sound like I'm being critical to racing because I'm not, because I'm actually being critical to myself. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to that point where I tell you about the Funky Farm, which is a sanctuary that I now am involved with, my wife and I own, right? I have to evolve with what people see acceptable with what we do with our animals at our sanctuary. Um, but I'll talk about that in a moment on that though that's all based on perception and we spoke a little bit before about how we we've got glass half full yeah now a lot of these minorities in my opinion and everyone's entitled to have an opinion i believe that a lot of these minority groups which have got a much louder voice today than ever before quite often are glass half empty people. absolutely they look for stuff they look for stuff and now, negative and then through their through their map of the world, which is based on their experiences, based on their childhood, based on their traumas, based on their education, based on everything they've experienced in their life, they're coming from, a, in my opinion, from a place of pain. Yeah. And I encourage anyone of that mindset to look within themselves and to heal themselves and then comment on subjects that they have earned the right to speak about. And I think in this day and age, too many people have got too much to say about things that they've never, ever gotten deeper. They're commenting from on the surface, the perception piece that you talk about, and not getting into the heart of what everything's all about, like you've got with thoroughbred racing. You've lived it and breathed it for so long of your life. You've worked with animals for so bloody long. I believe people like yourself, voices should be enhanced and we should be giving more weight to people who are experts in their field. And when I say experts, somebody who's done at least 10,000 hours. Yeah. And you've done that and you've earned the right. And in this day and age, why well, I get so frustrated and so pissed off as well and I'm so passionate about it is people who haven't earned the right to speak on certain matters are given equal credibility to those who have. Sure. No, I agree. And, uh, yeah, it's just the way of the world we live in now. It's like saying everyone's a journo. You that's know what right. I mean? With yeah, social yeah. media, yeah, etc. Yeah. And that's um, a social media. Yeah, it's been and, great from so many aspects. And at the same time, it's given voices to people. And people, some people think they're entitled. Um, and anyway, it is what it is. But uh, I have an interesting philosophy on life. And um, to me, life is basically a video game. You're the main character. Uh, and your aim is to survive and pass every level to the best of your ability. Some people's games are boring, like Tetris or Candy Crush. However, some people... Come on, Tetris is a good game. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
It, it might be, but uh, <laughs> some people are more adventurous like Super Mario Brothers, yeah? Yeah. And then you have others that like a bit of action like Call of Duty. I thought you would have been a Call of Duty type oh, of no, guy. Oh, I'm no. Not, I'm not a massive violence person. Wow. Even, though, even though I found out my great-grandfather biologically went and served in Korea. He was Turkish. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter, you could say. Although when there's a fight that needs to be fought, I'll fight it. Yeah. Uh, Call of Duty, I always found it too too many sticks to control. <laughs> and growing up in the 70s and 80s and when the Atari 2600 came out, there was one stick with one button. Yeah. You know, I'm like old school. So Super Mario Brothers, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So yeah. you like a bit of adventure. I okay. like adventure, well, of course. I go through life trying to pass every level to the best of my ability. Some are tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it depends on what game you're playing. Uh, some have se- secret pathways, but it depends on whether you want to take them or not. Yeah. Um, some even have cheats, right? But it's up to you as to whether or not you want to be honest. So uh, you've got to just work out what your game is. And then the hard part is finding your mission because everyone does have a right. mission in life. And that is kind of mo- the way I look at it. I was once told by a very intelligent human being one day, there's two main things that happen in your life. And the first is the day you're born, and the second is when you find out why, okay? So that, that sinks into me quite strong, and I don't believe in the saying being in the right place at the right time. I believe you need to put yourself in the right place at the right time, yeah? And if you don't, if you're sitting at home doing nothing, your achievements aren't going to be as great, you know, um, but if you're networking, but it depends what game you're playing and depends what sort of life you want to live. And I suppose I'm not into video games, but I like a little bit of action and, you know, I'm not violent either. However, I'd be more like a Call of Duty because I'm looking for the next best thing, you know, and um, that's where kind of life's taken me in. And, and I've had amazing adventures, which I've spoken of a couple so far um and i want to talk to you about more you know and please and, please and one of which you know i've made reference to the funky farm on a few occasions and that's been a, a massive achievement not only for myself but for my wife and i suppose i'm going to talk about her a bit more before i delve into the funky farm because she's a massive part of my life we're a team and and we're an incredible team and we've been together for roughly 20 years now and we had an we, the way we met was quite unusual it was through a mutual friend uh without going into too much detail he was a very good friend of mine and it turned out uh that he had feelings for me uh it became a quite an awkward part of my life um quite a stressful part of my life where I ended up having to get restraining orders. He was a professional boxer and um, I had to move from house to house to stay away from him um, because he developed feelings for me. He had a partner, female partner at the time. It was the last thing I expected. We were training together, boxing, etc. As I said, we were mutual friends with uh, my wife and I, um, he introduced me to my wife and that's when things went pear-shaped. I saw that it was having an impact on him, um, nothing that had ever happened between us. However, mm. uh, I think there was hope for him that it would, But uh, and I don't have anything to do with him uh, now or I haven't since then, and, you know, uh, that was just another learning curve in my life. <laughs> what went, a curveball. But it was a major curveball, and... Um, he was still trying to find himself and, and right. uh, it was a scary time in my life, you know, getting restraining orders and anyways. Against a boxer. Yeah, pro boxer. But w- anyway, w- Sam and I met. Yep. We'd met years prior, um, but she wasn't keen on me back then. And Still a bit of a rat bag. Yeah, I must have been. <laughs> but uh, we've been together ever since and uh, we had an amazing wedding, right? So on the day of my wedding... I rode at Caulfield. I rode two. I had three rides, two winners in a second. I went home. We had our wedding at the property that we were living at the time. We, when I was a kid, I never got invited to weddings. Kids never do. But I but said, I "Bring your kids." I wanted this to be awesome. We had a jumping castle, mechanical bull. My wife has indigenous in her um, family heritage, and so we had a smoke ceremony at the beginning. Wow. Uh, Aboriginal dancers. Um, Sam rode in on a horse in a 
a cowboy outfit, like a Western, should I say, dress. And <laughs> I, I tried to look like wider and uh, it was an amazing wedding. Our honeymoon, spontaneous as life for us is. We went to the airport. We took the next flight to wherever it went with no luggage, whatever. Where did you end up? We ended up in... Um, fuck, where did we end up? Maruchidor. Um, did ya? Yeah, sorry. Sunshine so Coast. Again. So we ended up in Maruchidor um, and it was an amazing honeymoon. Uh, when we got back, we brought a farm uh, in Hastings, Mornington Peninsula. It was vacant land when we got there. So we originally built a barn and we lived in that and we had our beautiful daughter her name is ziva out of ncis ziva nice name um i love the name yeah it's so a nice name. She. Yeah, so yeah, yeah we got that um so we had her sorry and then uh we were still living in the barn we eventually built a house on our property and we originally set our property up for horses naturally we we're both from the the racing industry sam was also working in racing etc my wife was doing, Sam was doing uh, some voluntary work for an organisation called the RDA, Riding for the Disability, and uh, she was a volunteer there, and on this occasion, I somehow organised the Melbourne Cup to go to the facility in Balnaring, um, and we had this funny cockatoo named Genghis. Now, he was just a white cockatoo, but he had a real personality. So I took him on this particular day for whatever reason. I also invited a really dear friend of mine. His name's Troy Gleason, and I'd met him as an apprentice jockey at a at a trico meeting at Cranbourne. Now trico meeting meant they had gallops, so horse racing, they had dog racing, and they had the harness racing all on the one night. There's like I a went, race every ten minutes, right? Or yeah, eight, 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 it's a punter's paradise. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot going on yeah. that night. I walked out the front to have a dart, and I saw this fella in a wheelchair. So I took it upon myself to go over and introduce myself. And this is Troy Gleason. Okay, his father uh, was a harness trainer and driver, and his mum was also there too. So Ginger Gleason and his mum Chris and Troy. So I got chatting with him and Troy and I formed this relationship. Troy had cerebral palsy, quite severe. Um, and Troy and I have spoken every week since that night. This was, I was apprentice, keep in mind. Um, so this is before America and all that. So Troy and I became really good friends and he's one of my best friends and his family are like mine. Um, we're basically, we're gelled and uh, we have been friends ever since and I invited Troy on this particular day to come to the RDA and hold the Melbourne Cup, you know, and I took Genghis and what Sam and I noticed that day was this amazing event, not many people, we had the Melbourne Cup, we had horses and we had a parrot and uh, the impact the horses and the parrot had on these adults and children, uh, special needs, um, was incredible. And this was what sparked the next idea and the next chapter of our lives, you know. Yeah. So Sam and I discussed when we got home, imagine turning this place, the our new property, into a sanctuary where we can make it all wheelchair accessible and yada, yada, yada. And that's exactly what we did. We turned our property into a property now called the Funky Farm. Two rules at the Funky Farm, now home to roughly 300 animals, one of which, if a wheelchair can't access an area, no one does. And the other is we don't make any of our animals do things they don't want to do. This is where I talk about perception. I'll tell you a lot about the Funky Farm, now home to 300 animals mainly native to Australia. We have the likes of kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, emus, parrots, crocodiles, etc. So we started with unusual parrots and we escalated into uh, snakes, lizards, to eventually getting a crocodile named Crikey. Now all of our animals are captive bred. Nothing's been taken out of the wild. That's highly illegal. 
In fact, it's illegal for us to release animals back into the wild, okay, in Victoria, even if Is they're it? native to the area, and that's a biosecurity right. sort of situation. Now, we run our sanctuary a lot different to other zoos and sanctuaries, and I like not to use the word zoo. And I'll tell you why I don't use the word zoo. And this is where I get to uh, perception. So the word zoo is, the definition is a park-like area in which live animals are kept in cages and large enclosures for the public's exhibition and entertainment, right? Versus sanctuary, yep. which is a refuge or safety from pursuit prosecution or other danger a nature reserve where injured or unwanted animals of a specific kind are cared for we're a sanctuary okay and what makes us a sanctuary is yes we do have enclosures but we go over and beyond to keep our animals in the best possible situation they could be in in captivity open areas um and their husbandry and well-being is priority for us. So we run our sanctuary different to other places um, because, like racing and everyone and everything, we have a use-by date. Whether that's in our lifetime, it could be. Uh, we're seeing a, a shift. Even Melbourne Zoo are moving their... I believe they're moving their elephants to Werribee because of the perception of animals in a small enclosure mm. at the Melbourne Zoo, right? Mm. So we try to offer something that is hard to get anywhere else. So you have an entry fee, like every other zoo or sanctuary, um, and you're part of a group. So we run tours. So there'll be only capped at 18 people per group. You'll have a guided tour with a, a guide and a helper and you'll basically go on a journey throughout the funky farm, all wheelchair accessible. Our animals are all familiar with wheelchairs, so my wife and I and my daughter, we train our animals around wheelchairs, okay, So because that's a big part of what we do, some sort of animal therapy, I suppose. It's a very interactive tour. So what's important is that the individuals that, that come to our sanctuary have an experience of a lifetime and enjoy their day. But more important to us is that the animals have a better day, okay? And that is why we cap our groups. We can have three groups running at one given time, but they're all in different areas, stations I like to call them. So uh, one group will be out with the emus and kangaroos and wallabies. Meanwhile, another would be with the koalas and another would be with the wombats and basically you go to different areas over an hour and a half period and you have this amazing interaction with the animals now it's made very clear at the start of a tour that we don't make any, any of our animals do things they don't want to do so on the odd occasion the wombats won't come out so you won't get to pattern it is what it is yeah but more often than not they will because of how we do it okay so it's less overwhelming for the animals in small groups and obviously gives each individual the best opportunity with the animals as well. Now I'm blessed to have this place because um, I find myself today in a position where I can no longer be a jockey and uh, this come about because in 2015 I was involved in an accident on a race course where my horse broke its leg due to another jockey coming into my line. Uh, I clipped heels and went down, and in doing so, I broke uh, my T6 and 7 in my neck, my shoulder blade, and I had a really significant blow to the brain or head. Um, so I, on this occasion at Bendigo, I woke up and I was in hospital. Uh, my first memory of this incident was waking up to... Uh, my one of my best mates mum who lived up at bendigo um feeding me jelly i'd been in there for maybe one or two days already and she was in there looking after me i was very repetitive from what i've been told and took a long time to really recover from that accident um 
And did I fully recover? I definitely didn't. But I, in the background, had the funky farm that was starting to mould, but it wasn't open yet, yeah? So I didn't really have that yet to fall back on. So reluctantly, I had to work hard in that six months to recover and get back to doing the job that I knew best, and that was writing. I had responsibilities. I have a mortgage. I had a child and probably about 200 animals at that point that were starting to accumulate because of what we were trying to create at our property. Now, put a lot of pressure on me. I had to get back to writing. It was my only source of an income. So that's what I did. I rode again, yeah. and, and uh, I rode... Um, for about five more years in excruciating pain really? in my neck uh, and my head, you know. So uh, during that time, I was always looking for something else, you know. I can't keep doing this. I'm, I'm not right. My brain, I wasn't, my decision making wasn't there. My memory wasn't there. But I was trying to block all this out. I was still had that relationship with Channel 7. So I thought maybe there's something there. I, I, Ended up finding myself in the most bizarre position in 2017. I was back riding, but I was always looking for something, another something, you know. And I got a phone call from a bloke called Richard Keddy. Now, in 2015, who could ever forget that moment that Michelle Payne, the first female rider to win the Melbourne Cup in 2015 on Prince of Penzance, right? Mm. I have a great relationship with Michelle Payne, as I do with most of the jockeys, and that's why the helmet cam that had continued through these years was such a success, getting jockeys to wear it because of my relationship with jockeys, not only being with them most of the time in the jockey's room, track work, uh, but also playing a role on the Jockeys Associ Association, which I mentioned earlier. So I had this fantastic relationship with jockeys, including... Michelle Payne. In fact, I was actually helping Michelle with some endorsements sort of stuff, public stuff, um, prior to the 2015 Melbourne Cup uh, when she won it. I just decided to take a step away from it. This was big when she won the Melbourne mm. Cup, bigger than I had ever imagined and no doubt she'd imagined. And it was life-changing not only for her, but little did I know it would be life-changing for me too, okay? And so when she won the cup, the savages, the vultures, the sharks circled her, mm. you know, and I took a step back because it was beyond me and I was still out injured at this time with the car incident. I was doing the helmet cams. I was there when she won the Mum Cup. I remember that moment. I hugged her when she came back into her, into the jockey's room and... Um, it was such an incredible moment in sport and to be so involved in it was pretty special for me. Um, by Oaks Day, a couple of days later, Michelle had given me a call and knowing that I wasn't doing anything and my foot was still in plaster, etc., she said, I can't deal with this, the inundation of everything going on here, okay, with her phone had gone broken it down. Up. It was worldwide coming in right so with des o'keefe at the time he was the ceo of the jockeys association and myself we went on the hunt for an agent this was beyond me i couldn't do it i would love to have done it but i wanted to give her every opportunity to get what she could out of this amazing achievement she'd been involved in right so mm. we interviewed a few people um with no luck, we just wanted someone to look after Michelle. Yeah. Like, really look after her. Holistically, like. like yeah. Corporate, yes, but at the same time, look after her as a human. As a human, yeah. yeah. Which is hard in that in that space, yeah. right? I was, we checked out a lot of um, AFL uh, agents and things like that. No one had, in racing had seen anything like this before. It was incredible, right? Mm. So... I reached out to a friend of mine called Lane Beachley, world champion surfer. And I met Lane sometime earlier because of my relationship with Jeff Ellis, right? Jeff rewarded me for winning on one of his horses one day and took me to Fiji for a holiday. 
all right, on this private island called Namutu. And this is where I had the opportunity to meet Lane Beachley and form a great relationship with her and her husband, Kurt Pingilly, from In Excess. I also met a gentleman by the name of Ben Crow, okay? Now, Ben Crow was uh, heavily involved with Nike, um, and he just created a new product or app called Unscripted with some colleagues of his, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about soon. But so I called on Lane Beachley from my experiences with her, not only on the island, but we formed this great relationship. She had a foundation called Aim for the Stars for young people um, that she'd created, and and I got on board with that. And we, I, we, my wife and I helped her with some fundraisers through racing to bring more awareness, to bring get more funds for her, etc. So we were involved in a couple of events for Lane with the Aim for the Stars. So I called on her. I was using my network, you know. I'd been networking for years now. I had this amazing network, mm. still do. Mm. And doing those favours with for Lane, um, with the Aim for the Stars, you know, not that she owed me one, but this is how networking works, you know. You call on each other when you need help. Yeah. With something. So Lane put me in touch with a lady by the name of Nanette from the Saxton's, the Bureau of Speakers, right? Yep. So Nanette and I and Des O'Keefe sat down and Nanette was a hard ass, man. And I honestly, I'll be honest, I, I thought she's the one, but is it going to work, right? Because Michelle, you know, bless her heart and I love it a bit. But I thought there could have been, um, they could have been a personality clash, right? That's just my honest opinion. Well, I'm proud to say that Nanette, s- to this day, is still uh, Michelle Payne's um, management. Not only is she her management, she's a role model, she's a friend, she's quite like a mother figure for Michelle who did unfortunately lose her mother at a, as an infant um, mm. in a car accident, right? So Nanette took Michelle under her wing and has protected her the whole way through. And not only that, has created so much more. The book deal, um, the movie, and so much more for Michelle in endorsements, etc. and really probably has set Michelle up and strategically has positioned her that it wasn't burnt out over six months. She's so relevant even today Mm. and will continue to be into the future. And that's a lot to do with the way Nanette runs her business, right? So this brings me back to the phone call I received by Richard Keddy. Richard Keddy had brought the rights to a movie about Michelle Payne called Ride Like a Girl. He wanted to meet up with me and I met up with him in Albert Park with a woman by the name of Rachel Griffiths, okay? Now, we sat down and uh, they wanted me... Well, first of all, he said to me, we've brought the rights to the Michelle Payne movie and we don't know much about horse racing. We've been going to the races, meeting new people, but every time we ask people about uh, getting assistance with creating the movie, your name keeps coming up. And I said, well, that's odd. Why is that? And they said, because you created the helmet cam. Rewind back to Tommy Sadler, ran me over in a car park. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Created a meeting with Channel 7, which created the creation of helmet cam. Some years later, helmet cam, because of a positive attitude, has now got me sitting down face-to-face with Rachel Griffiths and Richard Keddy discussing being part of being a, being a consultant for the movie, right? It's just funny how things happen. Everything happens for a reason. Absolutely. So I grabbed it with two hands and I originally took on a role as a consultant, but it ended up a bigger role than that. So my wife and I and another guy called Peter Patterson our involvement in the movie without sounding narcissistic or egoish or whatever the word is, we created the movie. 
there was no movie without us and obviously without so many others that were involved. Uh, it was an incredible experience working with some fantastic people and Richard Keddy, the producer, he also produced Oddball, is possibly one of my, I will say, good friends. Not only that, mentor. Uh, I've got some fantastic mentors in life, one of which is Des O'Keefe, who I've referred to on many occasions. Yep. The other is Richard Keddy. And earlier I mentioned Joe Hall, who I was apprenticed to in um, South Australia, yep. who, bless his soul, is no longer with us today. But uh, they're the three kind of uh, role models, as well as another gentleman by the name of Gary Gibb who helped me in the racing industry early doors. Now, the movie, this wasn't a new level in this game that I was playing. Uh, This was a new game, right? This was life-changing for me, um, and I saw it as an opportunity. Maybe this will turn into something else. You know, maybe I'll get a role in other movies, etc., that's that's how I took this role on and I was passionate about it and it would have taken 10 years off my life and my wife's. It was really stressful. The product was amazing at the end. Uh, it was six months of really hard work. Keeping in mind we're, we're still trying to build the funky farm. It's still going in the background. Yeah, yeah, that's going on in the background. And I was still riding in races. Like, But I was looking for a way out. I'm in pain. My head's hurting. My memory's playing up and I had no idea at this point because I'm working for Channel 7, I'm riding as a jockey, I'm doing podcasts, I'm doing a movie, I've got shit going on everywhere. Everywhere. And it created tension between my wife and I because she would say something to me and it didn't absorb and then the next day, I told you to do that or whatever and I'm like... What are you talking about? You never said anything. Oh, I did, but you forgot. I didn't forget. I've got so much going on mm. on my plate. That's why I forgot. Uh, uh, uh. This is when COVID hits, right? When COVID hit, like everyone else's life, my life slowed right down. No movie, no podcasts, barely race riding, um, no Channel 7, right? So everything's come to a halt. But plenty of family time, Plenty of time on the farm, plenty of animal therapy, you know, at my place. So this is when I realized I've got a problem here. She's right. Sam's right. My memory's cooked. I'm getting headaches still. My neck, I can't look left and right certain days. So I looked into getting some surgery done. I didn't know whether the headaches were coming from my neck, my head. I didn't know what was going on, but... Once everything slowed down, that's when it hit home. I've got a problem. Started seeing neuropsychs. And it just so happens, you know, I've got uh, issues with my brain. I have, you know, from the knocks that I've received. Probably that last one was a, you know, that was a deal breaker for me. So um, that's something that I've had to work with Mm. now. And I had to make that decision about horse racing you know i had to say no i can't keep doing it so what did they find what did they find so i ended up having some surgery i had the nerve endings burnt off my spine and numbed on my spine up into my head it didn't have the desired effect that we were hoping and i wouldn't say it hindered it but it definitely didn't work so i was going to get the other side done but i'm not now um i still get constant treatment massages therapy with whatever um I can't sleep without tablets. You know, I'm on certain drugs to numb the pain, I suppose. Um, reluctant to have them, but I need them. Mm. Uh, and I'm so lucky I've got a great community around me, friends and family, um, that have helped get the funky farm off the ground because without it, I don't know what where I'd be. So I'm really fortunate about that and... Um, I'm fortunate about the life that I've led to get me there. It's all been stepping stones, right? And what we've created is like no other. Um, And Troy was a massive part of that. Uh, And along the way, as a jockey, possibly the most dangerous industry in the world, 
where you have an ambulance following you around. I've endured broken bones and concussions, etc. But I've also lost friends from race falls to death. And I've lost friends, not lost, but uh, I have several friends that have acquired brain injuries, right? And that scares me as well, not just for them, because they're my friends. I see so much going on. The people that were there before their accident are no longer there today, okay? That pisses me off, one, but it makes me want to make a difference. So the Funky Farm has now branched off into another area, which is called the Mornington Peninsula Wildlife Project. Now, the Mornington Peninsula Wildlife Project is basically... A mirror of the funky farm, animal-wise, so it has the same species, etc. However, it runs its own race. It it plays a different role. Funky Farm runs tours for able-bodied, special needs. Whoever wants to go there can go to the Funky Farm, and it became so popular, the Funky Farm, that it was taking away from what I wanted to really do, and that is the Mornington Wildlife Project. Okay, so. Basically there, it's, it's still in the mix, it's still getting built, but we run programs there. Um, we've run a pilot program for special needs adults where we, over a 12-week period, we can not only teach them a trade in animal husbandry, animal training, animal skills, but also construction, life skills using lawnmowers, whippersnippers, uh, public speaking. Um, so we focus on different areas that are going to um, have a positive impact for the individual, okay? So there might be 9 to 12 participants in a group and they basically come once a week on their designated day, whether it be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, and they have their own project. Each day of the week over that 12-week period have their own project. Monday's group, for example, their project might be building a veggie patch. Tuesday's group might be building a lizard enclosure, and so on. Incredible. So over that period of 12 weeks, we create a community. We get like-minded people, similar disabilities in each group, working together, um, learning how to work with one another, but creating a community as well as teaching them life skills and potentially getting them into the workforce afterwards is something that we're trying to achieve and uh it's that hasn't been an easy feat in itself um and again it's taken good friends and family around me to help create what we're trying to do there i had something incredible happen to me and it was a life changer for me and we remember certain things like the birth of our children uh highlights um athletes remember a special moment in their careers well, to me, this is top five, and it was about nine, 12 months ago. We had an organisation come out, and they were called Blind Sports, okay? So keep in mind, some of these participants or patrons that came part of this group were born blind. They'd never seen a colour, for example. They wouldn't know the colour green. They might know what grass feels like by touching it, but they don't understand the color green or the the word a blue sky you know we can tell them but mm. they don't understand mm. to a degree so imagine having a 14 or 15 year old girl she would have been born blind legally blind um she was with her sister i'm not sure if it was her twin they looked very similar and the relationship she had with her sister was incredible her sister was her eyes yeah she had a cane uh, to help when she was walking. She'd probably been told about koalas that live in a tree and crocodiles that live in the rivers and whatever up in Darwin, but never fully understood it. What you find with people, whether they're deaf, whether they're blind or whatever it might be, their disability, people, everyone's got a superpower. Okay, doesn't matter who you are, you've got a superpower. And for someone that's vision impaired, their superpower can quite often be their nose, sense of smell increases, 
their hearing or even touch. So their senses are elevated in different areas because they rely on different senses. To compensate. Absolutely. Mm. So can you imagine a 14, 15 year old girl that's never seen before and I'm holding a koala on my waist and I've got her hand in my palm and I basically let her touch the ear of a, of a koala and I say, this is the ear of a koala and now you're going down its back and take her hand around to its claws down its back and then tell her to put her nose up to its fur and, and smell the koala, right? Wow. Mate, this was life-changing, not just for her, for me or anyone else that was in within a metre of us and I'm getting goosebumps. You can so, see that. So, can you see that? So, so right? I can see them. Right, because I've never experienced something like that. It, I feel like crying thinking about it because... Uh, you're making it making we're making a difference you know we're, we've it blew my mind next we've got a crocodile out you know um wow. she's touching a crocodile you know and the her face was incredible it, it blew my mind and we've done some awesome things for other different um organizations like we've learned sign my wife my daughter and i basic sign language for the deaf community. We don't want anyone to miss out on what we're doing at the Funky Farm. And and we've gone over so many stepping stones to get there. Um, and it's been an amazing journey all the way. And I suppose I need to backtrack because I, I haven't finished telling you about someone I mentioned earlier by the name of Ben Crow. Um, ben Crow and I that met on this island, Namutu. He was uh, affiliated with Nike at some point and he's a motivational speaker now and he runs a awesome uh, Insta site called Mojo and basically that's what it is, Find Your Mojo. Mm. And he's been an inspirational person to work with and, and we did work together because on this island he was telling me about this unscripted app that he'd just created. And basically it was an app where athletes all over the world could create their own content. There's so many laws and rules around telecasts, whether it be F1, whether it be soccer, whether it be um, intellectual property, yeah? It's a, it's a big thing in the world around, we live in. Around like what you can and can't do if you're like an athlete Correct. or an entertainer yeah. and you've got contracts but, in place. Exactly. So, for example, I'll use Usain Bolt. If he's at the Olympics mm. um, and it's being telecast, it, he doesn't own that, you know, even though it's him on the image, right. it's not him, yeah? Right. But if he's at home filming himself on a iPhone, that is his intellectual property. So Unscripted basically was a platform where athletes around the world could create their own content and leverage out of it what they can, right? right? Yep. And put it on this platform. So Ben Crow was in the process with a team of making this product. And I told him about an idea that I had. Another and I, one. Yeah, another one. <laughs> and it, I called it jockeys.com. Because like other athletes, jockeys were kind of locked into not being able to create their own content. And their content's gold, right? Because who wouldn't want to hear from Damien Oliver before he rides in a race? Or even still hear from Damien Oliver after he's ridden in a, in a race. So what I wanted to do was with, I wanted to create content for the jockeys to make for the punters or the people that had an interest in racing um, could access. But I had roadblock after roadblock because I talk about this toxic industry called racing, right? And it starts at the top. Mm. And I put this on a silver platter like I did with Jeff Ellis with the reality TV show and so many other things and ideas that I've taken to this organization. And you get laughed out, right? 
Racing.com was a new product. It had just been put on. Yeah. Uh, they'd done deals with Channel 7, etc. This was a new product. Racing.com had the rights to all Victorian content, racing, photographs, everything. If it was on a racetrack, it was owned by Racing.com. But I thought that jockeys should be paid for their content. So with jockeys.com, I put this whole proposal together. I took it to Racing Victoria, as I always did, on a silver platter, and I handed it to them. But the jockeys needed to be monetary rewarded, okay? Financially rewarded for their content. They laughed and kicked me out again. Um, Racing.com own all the footage, which is owned by Racing Victoria. And it was just... Uh, toxic everything's toxic everything i've had to do with that join is toxic yeah and it's unfortunate but it is what it is ben crow rings me sometime after our Man- namutu island experience and said he's still doing that jockeys.com i said i hit roadblock after roadblock he goes what about if we incorporate it into our unscripted we get the jockeys at home damien oliver can talk about his ride in the Melbourne Cup or whatever race he's riding in, and then he can also provide us with a post-race analogy. Why shouldn't a punter, for example, let's, for example, say that you go and put 500 of your hard-earned dollars on a horse that I'm riding at Bendigo, right? Why don't you get an explanation? You've invested $500 and I've sat five wide and ran up more asses than you could imagine and had no luck and you've done your dough. I still got paid as a jockey, right? But I don't have anyone to answer to except for the owner and the trainer who would probably be pissed off. Wouldn't you love an explanation? So this was creating a platform where you as a punter could actually hear what Chris Simons has to say about your investment on Saturday at Bendigo. And I might have stuffed up, and I'm going to be honest and say, I drew barrier one. I don't know how I ended up five wide. Um, You know, it was a shit ride, or I had no luck, or the horse didn't feel right, or what. There might have been an excuse without it being my own. There might have been factors that you're not aware of, right? So this was about evolving, yeah? This was about keeping up with the times racing get with the program so handed it to him on a silver platter no nah, not interested unscripted were interested so ben crow and i we signed up every jockey in australia had them all on it we had it all on it we did a deal with ladbrokes this was going to be huge for ladbrokes for racing for the jockeys this was a new thing but roadblocks just kept coming to the point where jockeys weren't allowed to say certain things. Yeah. They couldn't be honest. And it it didn't work, you know, and Ladbrokes weren't happy. We did a six-month trial. Without the support of the industry hierarchies, what hope did we have, yeah. you know? So it died a miserable death and um, it is what it is. And uh, But again, Ben Crow, I should put him into that category of mentors and someone that really provides me with motivation and 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 whatnot but uh it's amazing where you end up in life who you end up with and this is where i get to saying there's no such thing as being in the right place at the right time you've got to put yourself in the Mm. right place in the right time and that's why i did namutu i was in the right place at the right time but i hopped on that plane and I'm very good friends with a jockey named Craig Williams. You may have heard of him. He's won a Melbourne Cup and every major, including the Everest, as recent as on Saturday, the biggest race in Australia, financial race in Australia. Now, Craig's always been a good friend of mine. Um, or should I say always? I, I, I met Craig as, a, as an apprentice. He, hadn't, he wouldn't even remember this day. He was a fully-fledged senior jockey and he was back and forward from England at the time. And I was in the trotting ring at, uh, I was only a kid trotting around. I hadn't, didn't have my license to ride in races. I was just trotting a horse around in the trotting ring. And I'll never forget the conversation that I had with Craig that day. And he went out of his way to have a chat with me as we went round and round and round. He wouldn't remember it. And I've never mentioned it to him again, but it's one of those moments that I remember. When 
I found, finally was back from the States and I had momentum. I was around Craig a lot. I was competing against the best and he was the best. Um, he wasn't quite the best best at that point, um, but he was slowly he going up that ladder. Up. And mm. uh, I was actually apprenticed to his father when I came back from South Australia. I was apprenticed to his father for some time, Alan Williams. Now, Craig... For those of you that don't know him, he's a he's a very well spoken, well educated, articulate, straight to the point type of guy. Brilliant the way he articulates he, absolutely anything. Now to a point where originally, when I was competing against him a lot, um, is it jealousy? I don't know, but you know, I had this thought, God. Why is he so nice? This can't be true. It's bullshit. No one can right, be that yeah. nice all the time, yeah. you know? And yeah. I used to think, he's taking the piss, isn't he? Yeah. He wasn't taking the piss. And it wasn't until years later that I discovered he's sincere. Like, and I'm sure other people were thinking the same. He couldn't be like this all the time. Well, I can promise you he is, okay? And I know this because I've spent a lot of time with him, not only as a jockey, but away from the races in as recent as three or four months ago where uh, I went to the Ukraine with him. And, and um, that's a bucket list sort of thing, going to the Ukraine. Incredible. I've never been to a, a war zone before. And uh, Craig and I talk quite often. He's one of the few jockeys that I have had a lot to do with since I've stopped being a jockey, okay? Um and he's an incredible human and he does so much uh, for so many people and uh, doesn't ask for recognition. And And I help him in certain areas with the social aspects of his social media, etc. Anyway, in chatting, he's married to a, his wife's from Ukraine. He has two children from the Ukraine and he wanted to make a difference. Yeah to the people of the Ukraine, including his family that mm. are there, his in-laws, etc., cetera. Um, and so did his wife, Lisa. So off his own bat, he raised money. Um, he advocated to, he networked, he, he, he wanted to make a difference, and, and he is. And, and in doing so, he's done two trips over to the Ukraine, and I was lucky enough to be invited to his second trip um possibly the scariest time in my life uh and it sounded like a great idea at the time while i was still standing in australia but yeah. believe me getting yeah. on that plane and heading to europe uh was somewhat frightening and not one to have ever experienced that i believe anxiety until my trip to the ukraine and I've heard Craig talk a lot about the Ukraine since we've been back, and I think he plays it down a lot. It was fucking scary. It really was. It was... Um, I was Googling to buy a... How, where do I buy a bulletproof vest? We were hearing all these stories coming out with the Russian invasion, what they were doing to civilians, what they were doing to soldiers, what they were doing um, to internationals westerners going over there was barbaric you know and here i was on a plane heading into that zone so we arrived in warsaw which is in poland um i spent i went over before craig i went with it with lisa his wife and another gentleman um so we went over early doors and um, we started sorting out the logistics. So Craig had purchased four cars in Europe. These four cars were going to take all the stuff that we, the supplies that we had for frontline and civilians into the Ukraine, four vehicles. Two were going to come out, two were going to stay in the Ukraine and be turned into makeshift ambulances. So... Little did we know that the cars couldn't come back over. And I haven't told my story. And I was approached by lots of people in the media when I arrived back in Australia. Um, people wanted me, 
I put a post up, I'm home, yada, yada, yada. Because mm. a lot of people were interested in whether I was going to come back alive or not, right? Mm. Including um, you. Yeah. So <laughs> I was approached by certain people in the media and I was reluctant to talk about any of it because this is not my story. This is Craig's story. I was just going along for the ride and it was one of the most in- incredible experiences I've had in my life and I'm not keen to go back over because it was scary, yeah? Riding in races is scary. This was scarier than that. Um, so basically the four cars went in. We drove 10 hours straight from Warsaw down the border into the Ukraine. Going over that border was you know, it was pretty intense. And what was intense? What was this? What was so scary about it? Well, you saw the landscape change straight away from Poland into the roads change straight away. The the immigration area that Poland had compared to the tin shed that um, Ukraine had was like you knew you were going in you to a completely different world. Was it like in the space of like a minute? A or two, minute. A so minute, like so it went basically from... I went through no man's land for maybe 400 metres. Right. And you're approached by someone with a semi-automatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, this has changed already, right? The whole landscape changed. Everything changed. To the point you drive around a corner and we had a convoy of four cars and I was the third car, and I even did research on those convoys, which one's the safest, you know. (laughs) And I turned out the third car wasn't, but I didn't get to choose where I was, right? Because we couldn't even take our mobile phones. We had to take our SIM cards out because the Russians that we'd been told had been honing in with satellites on your SIM cards, credit cards, etc. So we had to put all our stuff in, like, secured cases, we had no, originally no interaction with the outside world for the first few hours we were in the Ukraine. We hit hurdles straight away. We didn't have petrol. No petrol was in Ukraine. There was, you could only, you had to get government ex- exemption to get petrol if you were a local, you know. So that was one of our hurdles. And we met up with some different organisations along the way where we gave them the packages of mer- merchandise, care packages that could save mm. lives if they were underground for longer than a week. What do they have in them? Nutrition, the tablets you put in, water to purify, to purify yeah. um, uh, snacks, it had bandages, first aid. Just a, There was hundreds of these packs, backpacks, that we were giving out to civilians to help them in the case that they found themselves in bunkers for days, weeks at one given time. Can you imagine driving into a place that you've just been told has had four missiles hit it? That's where we were going. We were going to somewhere that was under attack. We didn't know where the front line is. Mm -hmm. No one did, yeah? So we're driving in. Every bend you went round, you'd you'd see soldiers with machine guns. You didn't know whether they were Russian or Ukrainian. The only time you found out was when they weren't shooting you, right? shitting ourselves <laughs> wow um so we made it to our destination we saw where these bombs had hit we spent a lot of time underground because sirens were bellowing the first time it happened oh, we were in a local shop in this village in choit kiev that's where we were um really old school town cobblestone roads the landscapes just so different veggie patches out the front of these little houses and really outdated. It was like we went back in time, basically. Um, innocent people that are having their lives ruined by a dictator and the fear in people's eyes, you can see. You almost, you almost think they're being rude, but they're not. There's some what of arrogance with Europeans overall, really, their demeanour. Aussies are pretty friendly people. Smile, g'day mate, whatever. 
as you walk past people. I found that even in Poland and in um, in Ukraine that when you do cross paths, the smile was like a bit off-putting for them. They were like, mm. why is he smiling at me? They'd look at you as if, what's right. he up to? We look like Westerners. Yeah. I filmed a lot of stuff over there, but I was restricted as to what I could and couldn't film because I wasn't wearing a T-shirt that said, don't worry, folks, I've got no SIM card in my iPhone. I had an iPhone with no SIM card, right? But when you're filming and whatever, I suppose when you're seen as a Westerner and the locals are like, I hope they're thinking, I hope he hasn't got a SIM card in his phone because we don't want to get missiled here. So you can't, I don't speak their language. I can't tell people that. I did some filming. We were down in a bunker. First off, we were in a, in this little village. We were in a, a shopping place and we got told to get away from the windows, right? This is the first siren that we'd heard. We didn't know what was going on. We got a phone call because now we've got burner phones. We got a phone call for one of our team members, which was Craig Williams' wife. She said, you need to get underground. So that's what we did. She directed us. It was her town. This is where Lace had grown up. So she told us where to go. We ended up at a, the school, which school's not in. It's all remote learning because of the war. We went underground. There may have been 50. There could have been 250 people in this bunker. I didn't know how long. It was like a rabbit warren. I started filming in there. Mm-mm, don't film in the bunker, right? They did not like that at all. And uh, so I did stop and respected their space. I was lucky enough, well, I wouldn't say lucky enough. I brought some missile home with me that hit the town of where we were staying. Thankfully, we were safe. We had dramas after dramas. We ended up with no car because we weren't allowed to take the cars back over the border. So basically, we had to leave all four cars in Ukraine. We got escorted out in a military vehicle and we drove past Lviv, which was basically under fire not quite when we were driving past but there was a lot of action going on there we had a big bullseye written on the side of our car we're in a military vehicle Mm. right we eventually got over the border by foot we crossed the border by foot into poland and we basically hitchhiked back to uh warsaw got on a plane and flew home i flew home earlier on my own craig and his family went to another place in Europe for a well uh, earned holiday. Which I can feel like through your storytelling, like to an extent. Yeah, of, crazy shit. It's um, crazy. And how was uh, how was the adrenaline dump when you got back on the plane to come home? Like, what did you learn about you? Uh, I learned a lot about myself. Mm. Um, and this <laughs> sounds silly. But the, one of the scariest moments in that whole trip was when I arrived back at Melbourne Airport. I got taken into an area where I was basically interrogated for a while while because uh, I had the stamp of the Ukraine. And um, I suppose the security here is so good, and I reiterate that because I got asked a lot of questions. What was I doing there? You know, they're not letting... I wasn't over there fighting. Remember one mm. thing, I was doing humanitarian aid. It wasn't military, but I think it's a different story if you are doing military. So um, that was a scary moment. And uh, But the relief, seeing my girls when I got home and, um, you know, I hadn't been away from my daughter for longer than three days straight, you know, 13 years on this planet, you know. So it was, it was challenging, but... Um, it was an amazing experience and I'm so thankful for being able to do it and I'm more thankful for um, still being alive. I'm not a religious person at all. I'm, uh, I'm an atheist through and through. I, I just believe in um, being a good person um, and we, we meet all sorts through our life <laughs> and you basically know... Um, the people you want to be around because you'll see their eyes light up whenever you enter a room. Yeah. Um, they're the people that you that are, are going to be with you when you need them and, um, and you'll meet the complete opposite through life. And uh, it's important to love yourself, but it's also important to love others. And um, 
working with athletes, not just jockeys, but in other genres as well along the way, the best of the best get their, they have to have an ego and that's just part of being who they want to be and they have to be selfish, I suppose. And I tend to think that's why I never got it to the top level as a jockey. I don't think I had that ego enough to be able to do that. And I don't, I'm not putting anyone down that does. Good luck to them, you know. Um, especially tennis players in individual sports. Mm. You, they need to love themselves. And I don't mean that in any disrespect, but that they, they need... There's some forms of narcissism that I can't cop, um, you know, on social media and stuff like that. I'm very particular of what I, I... I basically don't like social media. I use it. Most people do. Um, I use it for my own benefits in a selfish way for my business, which is the Funky Farm, not so much on a personal level. Um, and, I, you know, I, I have my own views on that, but that'll probably take up a full other podcast for you one day. So it's been a pleasure being with you. I don't, I think it's, I think I covered most things um, in however long I've been babbling for. It's been an incredible life so far and I hope to think there's so much more left and um yeah just uh the only advice I can give to people is work hard um so keep your credibility be honest and love yourself but love others just as much and yeah life's easy Chris Simons you've wrapped it up I don't need to say anything thanks so much for coming on you've got an incredible story and you might not have got one that group one yet on the back of a thoroughbred. However, there could be a group one coming your way in another form, and uh, all the re- all the rejection, what is, what's felt like reje- rejection, may just be redirection and taking you forward in, in this game of life that we're all on. So, blessings to you, brother. And I've just been blown away by everything you've spoken about today, mate. Thanks so much for coming on. You've been you've been brilliant. You've been amazing. I'm just like fucking unreal. Like, did you get all that? <laughs> Dude, fuck, and what a story. Maybe you need to be, maybe you need to have a movie made about you.